Hello, I'm Jackie Pfeffer Merrill, Director of the Campus Free Expression Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Today, I'm delighted to welcome to you to our conversation on Jonathan Mark's new book, Let's Be Reasonable, A Conservative Case for Liberal Education. Today, liberal education has many doubters. Parents and the wider public wonder if college is still worth the cost, if colleges and universities are true homes to open inquiries, or if liberal arts are outdated and outmoded in the 21st century. In his new book, published on Tuesday by Princeton University Press, Jonathan Marks replies to these questions. Before I uh, introduce our panel or, and turn it over to our moderator today, just a few words about the Bipartisan Policy Center. The Bipartisan Policy Center is a Washington, D.C. think tank that strives to promote security and opportunity for American families by bringing together the best ideas from both parties. In our Campus Free Expression Project, we aim to foster the next generation of bipartisan leaders by promoting programs and policies on college campuses that create a safe and welcoming environment for robust intellectual exchange. We were keen to have a conversation today about Jonathan Mark's new book and about liberal education more generally because of the capacity of liberal education to introduce students to ideas, books, and debates that help them understand and contextualize today's events and controversies, to become more thoughtful interlocutors with their peers on college campuses, and when they graduate, to be more thoughtful citizens. Our conversation today will be moderated by Steve Hayward, a fellow of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Steve joins us today from California, where he's a visiting lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley's School of Law. And Steve, before I turn it over to you, just a few minutes, a few remarks about our run of show. Steve is gonna moderate a conversation between Diane Sieber and Jonathan Marks that will run for about 35 minutes, and then we'll turn it over to audience question and answer. I encourage you in the audience to make a comment or observation about what you hear or to propose at any point during the conversation by uh, using the Twitter hashtag BPC Live or using the chat function on YouTube and Facebook. So Steve, now over to you and thanks everyone for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Jackie, uh, and welcome uh, Jonathan and Diane, and welcome to our viewers. Uh, in the interest of time and getting right to discussion, I'm just going to give name, rank, and serial number for uh, Jonathan Marks and Diane Sieber. You can, of course, find out all about them on that magical thing called the internet. Uh, Jonathan Marks is the department chair and professor of politics at Ursinus College in Pennsylvania, and Diane Sieber is the program director of the Herbst Program for Engineering Ethics Society at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Her interests include Renaissance, Baroque, and modern literature. And I'll just say this in addition, uh, if you happen to live in a windmill and you are fearful of a reckless charge by some Don Quixote, Diane is the person you want to have on speed dial. Uh, so what I wanted to do instead to start us out is begin, Jonathan, with the subtitle to your book, The Conservative Case for Liberal Education. Uh, I think everyone knows that there's been a sharp decline in enrollment and majors in the humanities over the last 25 years, just about everywhere, even a lot of the Ivy League universities. Uh, and conservatives invoke two explanations for this, at least two. The two leading ones are one ideological and one more instrumental and practical. And I want to get your evaluation of these, and then I'll have a similar question for Diane to respond to. Uh, the first ideological one, I'm going to paraphrase John Miller's review of your book in the Wall Street Journal this morning, where he says that for a lot of conservatives, the problem with universities is too much Karl Marx and not enough Jonathan Marx. And then the second one is more instrumental, which is the increasing cost of higher education, a, a cost increase that is beyond the rate of inflation, even of health care in the last 30 years, has caused practical minded students to say liberal arts subjects, humanities subjects, don't have enough market value to justify studying those subjects. So I wonder what you uh, make of those. Uh, of uh, I wonder if you'd evaluate those two propositions for us, uh, and we'll go from there. Well, thanks, Steve, and uh, thanks, Diane, and thanks, Jackie, um, and BBC and the Campus Expression Project. It's an honor um, to have my book discussed here. I want to also thank Carolyn, Nick, and others behind the scene who are making sure that my cat filter um, isn't on. So let me start with the ideological explanation. Um, that looks like more of an explanation, I think, 2015 and beyond, 
Um, so if you look at uh, the Pew survey, and I think the Gallup survey is pretty similar, and you ask Republicans and Democrats, uh, do you think that colleges or universities are somehow a force for good in the country? It used to be the majority of Republicans, uh, fewer than Democrats, but a majority of Republicans said, yes, we think that they are. Um, in 2015, um, there was a dramatic dip, um, whether it had to do with the campus protests that were going on at the time or something else, it's hard to know. But I've certainly found more and more since then. I don't really remember being asked before then, but I do remember being asked since by parents, you know, I'm concerned about sending um, my children to, you know, standard issue um, college. Do you think it's okay? And I, I usually tell them we don't eat children, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. Um, so I, I think that that is an explanation, but I think that it's a, a less powerful explanation probably um, than the money and market related one, um, in part because, as I said, these, these majors have been declining for some time. It's not, it's not that recent a development. Um, and I, I think a lot of students don't pay close attention um, to debates over higher education. They, they don't really come in here worried um, that they're going to be indoctrinated. They're most likely to say about a liberal arts course, not that um, I'm worried uh, that the professor um, is a leftist. Instead, they're going to say, I'm worried that it has no connection to my major, or I'm worried that it doesn't have much use. It's also the case that Republicans and Democrats alike um, in the Pew survey, at least, give the high cost of college, you know, high billing in terms of the reasons that they're concerned about the overall direction of colleges, where it's, it's almost entirely Republicans who give the ideology explanation. So it's a sort of across the board concern um, with money and marketing um, that it seems to me is, is, is the more powerful explanation of the two, though I think they both matter. Yeah. So, Diane, uh, I want to have you respond to the same question, but with a, a little different context. Uh, you know, everyone knows the old cliche that youth is wasted on the young. And sometimes in a provocative mood, I'll say that sometimes I think education is wasted on the young, or at least liberal education. And what brought that uh, somewhat pungent uh, thought to mind was the passage in Jonathan's book about his friend Bob the doctor who admits to having concentrated on his uh, very rigorous and demanding pre-med studies in college, and now in middle age, I guess, has come back to the liberal arts and has gotten curious about Plato, he told Jonathan. And that's what made us at BPC think we ought to have uh, a Diane Sieberon with us from the Herbst Center, because nobody is more practically minded than engineering students and STEM students. And yet here you are, here's Colorado Boulder with the program that's pitched towards STEM students. So. Two-part question. One is, I imagine most of our viewers are not familiar with the Herbst program, so say a little bit about what it is and how it got started, maybe about Mr. Herbst a little bit, who seems like an interesting person. And then second, uh, the more substantive part of the question, which is your students are practically minded students, and yet here they are uh, enthusiastically participating in an old-fashioned liberal arts curriculum. <laughs> well, first, thank you so much for inviting me to this discussion. And uh, Herbst was founded, as you say, by a very interesting man, Clancy Herbst, who graduated uh, from the engineering college uh, quite a while ago. And when he went out in the world and made his fortune, uh, he began to think, I've missed something. There's, there's something, th there must be more. And uh, as a result, decided that he wanted to found a program so that engineers would be exposed early to the big questions. And so the Herbst program is dedicated, it started as, an, as a great books program uh, that we have expanded the canon substantially so that we're not, um, we're not looking at, at just old books. Um, we're looking at quite relevant books, but, but the big questions remain. Um, you know, what does it mean to be human? Um, how should one live? What is success? What is integrity? Um, I think these are questions that are lifelong and that become more urgent later. Um, I think they should be urgent earlier. So uh, that's that's the the idea behind Herbst. And uh, thankfully, because it's an endowed program, we have very small classes. So uh, a group of 12 students will discuss this throughout the semester with a faculty member. Um, and you know, in a group that's small, you really can challenge each other 
challenge each other's ideas and establish a community in which mutual respect guarantees that you will not feel uh, threatened by having your ideas challenged. Um, so, so that, that is Herbst. And I think uh, what's fascinating about teaching engineering students is that a lot of them have come into college thinking that, you know, liberal arts, that's no answers, wishy-washy. Um, Karl Popper would make the distinction between clockwork kinds of studies and cloud kind of studies, right? Clockwork, we can prove it mathematically. Cloud, uh, we're not quite sure. And what's, what's great is to watch them apply the logic and order and categorization uh, abilities that they have as engineers to fundamental questions about humanity. Um, it is it is not different at all for them. Mm. Do you do you um, and maybe you don't, but I'm just I'm curious if you notice any differences between primarily STEM students and for lack of a better term, uh, your conventional humanities and social science students, or maybe you, maybe you don't have enough data to compare. I don't know. Uh, well, I've had the privilege of teaching engineering students for decades, so uh, I'm not I'm not sure that I actually am capable of of making that comparison. Okay. My sense is, however, that the engineering students um, who who may have believed that they uh, some of them may have believed that they wanted to avoid the humanities um, find humanities very rewarding when they realize that that humanities are meant to be about them. Um, mm. So. You know, I think that's that's kind of the key element to what we get to do. And honestly, teaching engineering students is like teaching honor students all the time. Oh, my. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, I want you to say a little more about Bob the doctor. I'm tempted to say that uh, Diane teaches Bob the builder and you have Bob the doctor. Uh, I, I wanted to learn more when I was reading that passage. And I wonder, is there an update? Can you say a little more about um, I don't know, I'm just interested in hearing more about Bob the doctor, if you have some additional things you can share with us. I should have told Bob to watch. Um, <laughs> so Bob, yeah, he's, um, I think, now now 93 years old. He's a graduate um, of my college. And um, he got in touch with me after I wrote an op-ed about the anti-Israel movement in academia. And he wrote and he said, thanks for your op-ed. It was wonderful. It's confirmed me in my decision made over a decade ago to no longer give money to Ursinus College, so thanks a lot. And I thought, oh, so, sorry, bosses, about that. So I, I got back in touch with him um, and discussed the programming that we have at, at Ursinus College. Um, so I told him, for example, about the common intellectual experience, which, you know, as Diane um, was uh, suggesting is a good way of going about things centers on on fundamental questions um what should matter to me how should we live together how can we understand the world uh, what will i do um and i discussed some of the books we read including books he was interested in because i i think you mentioned he had gone back to books like plato and euthyphro um and we struck up a friendship we've been corresponding i think for the past um uh, at least five years. Um, he's an impressive character, but what I, what I take from that story is that a lot of the hostility um, that we see uh, to higher education from conservatives, because Bob is a conservative, um, it's not based on some kind of hostility to reason. Um, it, it's not as if Bob is an ignoramus, far from it. He's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Um, he just wasn't convinced um, that any kind of truth-seeking activity was going on um, at the university. I think, I think there is a real opening, even with people who we think of looking at liberal education with a kind of implacable hostility um, to tell them what we're up to. Hmm. All right, let's, um, let's uh, press ahead this way. Um, I think it's not too much of an oversimplification to say that you can divide the intellectual scene of colleges into three parts, what we sometimes call the hard sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics, engineering, and then the social sciences, which investigate contested questions, but from an empirical basis, supposedly, and then the pure humanities, philosophy, history, literature, 
uh, and so forth, uh, where we, we take up contestable questions, where there are legitimate differences of opinion and grounded differences of opinion. And that's where an awful lot of the trouble is on college campuses today. And so uh, the challenge, I think, is, and maybe this is too broad a question, but I'll, I'll start it this way, is, uh, is there a way or should colleges be much more deliberate and conscious in conceiving the liberal arts uh, 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 as encouraging the old-fashioned uh, campus culture of academic freedom and free expression? Uh, or to put it a little more directly, uh, is a robust program in the liberal arts, however conceived and executed, is that one of the uh, neglected or important remedies for the excesses of what we call cancel culture and the self-censorship we see among too many students these days? Who wants to go first? Jonathan, why don't you go first? You're the author on the hot seat. <laughs> so I, I get to go first. Uh, the seat doesn't feel too hot yet, um, but I, I conceive of um, liberal education as uh, seeking to shape reasonable people. And I draw inspiration from John Locke. And John Locke doesn't think of reasonable people as possessors of a box of critical thinking skills, at least not simply or primarily. Uh, reasonable people say to themselves, there cannot be anything so misbecoming anyone who pretends to be a rational creature as not to yield to plain reason and the conviction of clear arguments. The reasonable person is distinguished by looking to reason as an authority rather than as a tool to get the better of others. Uh, the reasonable person says to himself, I guess he talks to himself a lot, um, let's stop playing around, let's stop boosting our team, let's stop hawking our wares, uh, let's stop puffing ourselves up, and let's consider as if it really mattered what valid conclusions um, we can reach based on um, what we know and what else might we need to know in order to get there. Well, um, a quick follow-up. All right. Sorry, well, go ahead. Yeah, because I, I haven't gotten to the piece about cancel culture yet, um, if you don't mind. You know, conceived in that way, yeah, um, liberal education is a, a, kind of, a, a kind of culture, right? It has a standard of praise and blame. And you can think of the standard of praise and blame for cancel culture as something to the effect of, you know, are you on my team or are you in my way? Are you on the right side of history or are you on the wrong side of history? Um, whereas a community devoted to being reasonable, the sense I just described that puts let's be reasonable on its banners and chooses appropriate mascots has a different standard of praise and blame. Um, can you set aside um, partisanship, interest, fashion in order to follow the argument where it leads? Now, where it leads exactly, one can tell, but there's a tension between that culture and cancel culture. And it has something to do with Locke, uh, and John Stuart Mill talks about this also, the problem of partiality, for a good thing to talk about at BPC, right? We see, but in part, we know, but in part, and therefore it is no wonder we judge not right um, on the basis of our partial views. You know, Locke thinks we need to speak even to people who we think aren't as talented as we are, and we certainly need to listen to the opposite arguments of talented people, and that at least cuts against the kind of hyper-partisanship that makes us want to suppress and cancel other people. So I think that there's a way in which free expression fits into that, fits into, um, that general idea of liberal education. Yeah, let me pose the question, Diane, to you this way. Uh, some people say, I'll put it in a passive-aggressive way like that, that big universities aren't very good at asking big questions for a couple of reasons. One is they're too much of an ideological bubble. The other one is uh, more neutral is that big, especially R1 universities like Michigan or Berkeley or Colorado, uh, because of their size and mission are too specialized to do the old liberal arts questions very well. Uh, and there you are as something of an outlier with the Herbs program, although they're not, uh, Colorado is not the only place with such a program. Uh, but I wonder uh, if you've thought about or have conversations with administrators and people in other departments about how a liberal arts orientation like you have can be emulated more productively across campus. Uh, so th those are some great questions. And I think um, 
the one of the first things that that crosses my mind is that uh, Jonathan makes the point that universities aren't selling what they do particularly well. And and part of that is that we're not selling that we're trying to uh, get people to understand what reason is that how you instead of canceling anybody who doesn't agree with you that you listen carefully to what they've said, that you engage in, in a required dialogue, right? So uh, fundamentally, this is not a new question, right? This is sophists versus philosophers. This is polemic versus dialogue. Um, so so this, is, this is human that we're having this conflict now. Um, and I think it's appropriate that universities are where we're living this out because uh, free speech is constitutive of our institutions. Um, if we don't engage in open dialogue and listening and carefully responding and respecting uh, our interlocutor instead of considering them an adversary with whom we're at war, um, there is no development of new knowledge. So if our job is to produce knowledge, that is the method by which we do it. Um, so I'm making notes here for our task force, which we this, haven't talked about and probably won't, but I, I'm tempted to write down from what you just said about sophists and philosophers. Uh, point number one, everyone needs to go back and read Plato's Gorgias if they never yes. read it before. Um, <laughs> the other thing that our task force has discussed, just to reinforce your point, is that we're not doing a very good job of teaching students to reject an argument without rejecting the person making it. Right. Uh, it's been, I've been surprised at how many uh, 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 administrators and, and uh, other academics that Jackie and I have recruited for the task force have come back to that point. And I thought, well, maybe colleges need to say that more directly and frequently than they do now, say at first year orientation. Uh, but then secondly, uh, think more deliberately and self-consciously about how liberal arts instruction could reinforce that. Um, but that brings me back, Jonathan, to the, the character of reason. Uh, I, I, the two terms you often hear a lot these days is that uh, in the social sciences, it's confirmation bias. People seek out empirical evidence that supports their point of view, happens all the time. In the humanities, we tend to call it uh, motivated reasoning. And so the point is, perfectly reasonable people can still be, how I put it, um, I won't say defective, but biased because of uh, your confirmation disposition uh, or motivated in their reasoning because of what we do nowadays, we call our priors, right? That's the phrase that's used all the time. Uh, and so I don't, you know, how do we pierce that problem? How do we self-consciously grab hold of that and try and press students and faculty for that matter to do better? Thank you. Yeah, you, you remind me a little bit of um, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, in which uh, uh, he discusses, he's a psychologist um, who discusses the way in which we're very bad at doing this for ourselves individually. And so he imagines um, a, uh, uh, an office in which people are having conversations around the water cooler <laughs> about the different kinds of uh, fallacies that people fall into. I um, mean, that does get to the idea that um, in intellectual community um, is quite important. Uh, Locke is well aware of this problem. Much of his educational writing um, is about the problem of partisanship and bias, and uh, it's a constant battle to try to overcome it. That's one reason that when you're talking about uh, the idea of, of culture, right, you, you need a culture that's, that's opposed right, um, to something like cancel culture. So we need, in a way, constantly to be reminded um, of the importance of, um, of, uh, of trying to uh, set aside um, our interests, trying to set aside our party. Now, that may seem impossible. We do have models um, of ways in which this is done. Um, you can think, for example, about scientific communities. They always do it, you know, you might say quite imperfectly, um, but these are people, however ambitious, you know, they are, um, they're expected to enter into a community in which they lay out their view um, for the scrutiny of others um, across differences of, um, of opinion, across differences of desired result, um, across national boundaries and they're to pursue the arguments, the evidence, where they lead, um, even if it leads them somewhere they don't want to go. So they become comfortable or they're supposed to become comfortable or become partially comfortable 
um, with the idea of the ground shifting beneath their feet. Um, so you might imagine some scientists come in thinking, what I like about science is it's absolutely certain. Um, they have to sort of receive a training, um, a, a kind of acculturation, which they come to understand that science has something to do with, with not knowing, right? Uh, with a kind of intellectual humility. Similarly, professions, right? The medical profession, even the much maligned legal profession, right? To introduce practitioners um, to standards um, that they might be not be used to um, uh, you deploying, right, on, on a daily basis. You, you you have to learn, you know, not not to kill the Democratic or Republican patient just because you don't like him. Maybe most people um, don't have to learn that, um, but you do have to learn a kind of uh, um, standard um, of, of of a profession. So I think there's an analogy here. I think it's much harder, right, to do it globally than to do it. Um, in a profession or just in the sciences or, or what have you, because our, our arguments are often more vehement um, outside um, of those places. But, but I still think the relative success of those models should give us hope um, at the success of, of spreading um, a kind of culture of, of, uh, of reason. Well, a quick follow-up question. Can you give me and our, our listeners one or two specific examples of what's worked in the classroom? things that you would recommend people look at? Um, well, I, I think that, that one thing that it helps a lot to, to talk about in the classroom is that, you know, often students, when, the, when they're outside um, of, uh, say, mathematics or the natural sciences where they have a pretty good idea um, at least of what, what they imagine the standards for distinguishing between truth and falsity are. Um, when they get into a classroom that involves, as you said, matters about which reasonable people disagree, um, they have trouble grasping, I think, at least some students have trouble grasping the idea that a conversation consists of uh, anything other than people you know, stating their opinions. And that's, that's sort of where you're stuck. And you know, a lot of public discourse looks like that. So in a way, you know, who, who can blame them? Um, so I, I think the, the deliberate taking up, right, of the question of um, what kinds of standards are available to us um, in those areas can be quite helpful. Um, in some of my classes, I read um, an article I like very much by the political theorist Ruth Grant. Um, I think it's called Political Theory, Political Science and Politics. And she takes a, she takes up this question, um, and she uh, she, she uh, um, introduces standards like um, you know comprehensiveness, clarity, depth that uh, can be recognized as extensions of criteria we use you know when we're not in the classroom or having arguments of other people, um, and then you look for examples of ways in which authors are deploying um, those standards. Um, in their own work, and um, you try to, you know, bring to consciousness um, the use of those standards. I think sometimes students, you know, um, feel like when they're in discussion class, they have to talk for the sake of talking in a way because, because there aren't clear standards, and so they might lose interest um, in the discussion because they, they don't think there's any means of making progress um, in the discussion. So I, th I think it's helpful to be deliberate um, about uh, about that problem and try to introduce some uh, at least uh, provisional uh, solutions to it. Yeah, so Diane, a similar question. Um, uh, you know, no one, well, I'll put it this way. I know, I've known a lot of engineers and one of the things they're always very conscious of is instrument bias. In other words, the mistakes made by, you know, satellites or measuring equipment. So it would seem to me it might be a little easier to talk about questions of penetrating bias with engineers. I don't know. I don't want to confine you just to talking about your particular students, but I thought you might have some interesting observations of your own from your experience. And then more generally, uh, what are your own thoughts on the problems of confirmation bias and motivated reasoning and how to fight it? Um, so uh, yes, engineers are, are, are taught uh, as they arrive that they, that they have to be aware of, of all of these potential factors that will disrupt their findings. Um, and, and in a sense, our job is to show them that that functions everywhere, right? That um, 
uh, that, for example, in a in a course where from day one you can convince students that it's okay to ask someone else, um, why do you think that? Tell me more, and not for that not to be a personal threat. Um, the the fact that within these classes we can model that kind of behavior. A student who who can ask us, the faculty, why do you think that? Tell me more, um, and challenge a view. Um, you know, this is a scientific method also, right? And I, so I, I don't see that there's a fundamental difference, but one of the most important things we can do is indicate that, that, that all of humanity is, is careful inquiry. All of humanity is about listening to results and questioning them and testing our theories. So uh, this is, you know, the humanities may look wishy-washy on the surface, but um, but approached as a liberal education intended that to be, um, the humanities are, are rigorous and very challenging and are immediately personally relevant to all of our students. Mm. Uh, I wanna ask two more questions about methodology of teaching uh, the liberal arts, and then we'll turn to audience questions. We have a very good one in already from Phil Melita that I'll turn to. Uh, the first one is, uh, since uh, Jonathan, the book is about the conservative case for liberal education, um, uh, and and I don't know how directly you may want to take this on, but do you think uh, there is any general uh, generalizable differences between the way conservatives and liberal faculty teach the liberal arts? Uh, is it uh, do, do they? Do, uh, I'll put it this way: Do you think conservatives and liberals teach the great books differently in any important way? Um, thank you. So the book is entitled A Conservative Case for Liberal Education, which suggests that I, I think it's hard to generalize. At the same time, you know, being a conservative or a liberal often is about something more than policy matters. And so we tend to bring that framework um, into what we do. Um, for example, if I am a certain kind of traditionalist conservative, um, I might like the idea of reading books, but I might be suspicious of the kind of great books program that has an individual looking at books from widely different cultures um, and trying to get a sense of, um, you know, uh, transcendent truths from that. I might be more inclined, though I believe in transcendent truths, to think that the only way of getting to it uh, right is by, by deepening and broadening uh, my knowledge of my own culture. Um, so that then when I teach books, even if I'm teaching sort of the same books in the Western tradition, I'll tend to teach them as, here, this is your culture. Let's try to understand how best um, to live within and negotiate it. Um, and that's going to be something a little bit different from saying, uh, here are these fundamental questions, and, and you're living in this, this sort of universe of questions, and it's sort of up to you. Um, to figure out what you think about those things. That might seem a little bit too individualistic, um, liberal, and so on from a traditionalist conservative perspective. Um, in the interest of time, I, I won't give an analog on, on the left. Um, I'll just acknowledge it. Yes, I think there is some effect on the way in which texts are taught, but also that, that, that the texts have, have a power all by themselves, right? We're, we're not just ideologues, um, professors are professionals who are trying to get things right. They're human beings um, who are drawn to books. And uh, so, for example, I had two professors when I was at the University of Chicago. One was a historian who started out a class by saying, I want you to imagine that human beings have no nature and only a history. That was the historian Carl Weintraub. And then I, I had Alan Bloom, who often talked about the, uh, the way in which history could deform um, human nature. Um, and they, they certainly taught differently in some ways, but they both had a certain kind of fidelity to the text, which they were trying to understand better, that meant that they didn't teach them as differently as you might expect. And I wasn't the only one who learned a great deal from both of those professors. So, so the books have a certain power in themselves. And you know, most college professors are, are you know, professionals, not just ideologues. And, and they're human beings, um, say, relate to the books in that way, too. Diane, do you want to weigh in on this question? Or, you know, Jonathan and I are conspicuous conservatives, so we're perfectly comfortable talking <laughs> about it and saying provocative things. I don't know if you want to or not. <laughs> well, 
I, I guess the, the observation I would make is that by Jonathan's definition, a lot of us are conservatives and didn't know it. Um, so, uh, he, I mean, he describes the great middle, um, I think you refer to it as the I don't want no trouble, uh, people who don't speak up, but who do hold firm opinions about what professionalism is. And uh, I think that the criticism of, of extreme liberal as well as extreme conservative views um, has to do with a small minority on both ends who ironically tend to agree with each other on many things. Um, so, so, you know, were I to say, uh, is there a difference? I don't think there's a fundamental difference across most of the campus because we recognize what our responsibility is to students and we recognize what our private time is versus our public time, what our responsibility is to draw out knowledge and, and not to not to preach. Mm. Jonathan, one of the things you mentioned is a practical problem that affects anybody, whatever their ideological disposition might be. And that is, I guess I'll put it this way, the shorter attention spans of students in an age of 280 characters of TikTok videos of Instagram and so forth. And uh, I, my own impression is, is that this has created a lot more pressure on faculty not just to adapt to that attention span, but to be performers and entertainers in the classroom. I think more so than was true 30, 40 years ago when you know, I was in college and graduate school. Uh, I wonder, and you mentioned the book that some people say, you know, you have to keep articles short, you have to keep the reading short, you have to move along discussion quickly. I'm wondering also from another part of your book, you mentioned Earl Shoris in uh, his uh, program for non-traditional students in the liberal arts and how a lot of non-traditional uh, uh, students, you might say, really take to it, partly because they're challenged hard. And so I'm wondering a two-part question. Uh, one part is maybe we aren't challenging students enough. Uh, I have lots of thoughts on this. Uh, the second part of it is uh, you, all, you mentioned uh, you know, the great books. The great books are old books mostly. And one criticism of the famous great books curriculum is it's actually too much. Um, you know, I have a daughter at St. John's. I've talked to lots of students in the directed studies program at Yale. And a lot of them say, we love the program, but we go too fast. So I'm wondering maybe we shouldn't think about one part of the remedy here is not so much old books, but slow books, right? Uh, I mean, obviously certain books really require slow and patient reading. Plato's Republic, but also Tocqueville's Democracy in America, a more modern book that I think rewards slow reading. Uh, so I wonder if a less is more strategy might be recommended at this point. Uh, and I'll stop there. That was a lot of a, almost a word salad. So I'll stop there and let, uh, I'll let Diane go first this time and see what she wants to grab hold of. Yeah, I, uh, I think slow reading um, is, uh, is absolutely a counter um, because what if students are gonna be taught to reason, they have to learn how to read carefully. They have to learn how to do close reading. Um, they, they have to be given the opportunity to write down things that 20 years from now, they'll look at again and read in a very different way. So, you know, learning is slow and it is difficult. And I don't think there's any reason for us to try to make it lighter or easier. Um, and also, uh, you know, I worry about the, if this is Tuesday, it must be Plato phenomenon where we race through a survey of everything and fundamentally what they're left with is, wow, well, a lot of people said a lot of things. Uh, so I, I believe you can take any text and spend a great deal of time on it and learn what you would learn from having read many texts. So, um, yeah, I agree with you that that a slow education along with slow food and a slow life uh, is <laughs> perhaps much, much more attuned to, to the of humanity. Yeah, it looks like that. We're getting a little bit of a glitch with you, Diane, uh, but I'll, I'll ask you the same question, Jonathan, but with, but with, uh, with this preface um, for Diane's benefit. I was just yesterday having a conversation with one of your colleagues at the Herps program, Alex Priu, about how, my example was, Abraham Lincoln seems to me benefited from knowing three authors in his self-education, uh, the Bible, Shakespeare, and Euclid. There's probably more to it than that, and he's a, obviously a, a unique and extraordinary example, but there's an example of someone who really takes life lessons from a few authors read carefully and repeatedly. 
Uh, so anyway, same question for you, Jonathan. Uh, slow books instead of old books, uh, or what do you think? Um, yeah, tastes great or less filling, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and I'm kind of a, a, a let's have both um, kind of guy on that issue. I, I think there are some real advantages to reading um, a lot of books uh, relatively quickly. Um, one is that you can, you know, see connections and conversations going on among works um, that might be harder to see if you were just reading um, a couple. Another is uh, that if I may depart for a moment from my emphasis on reasonableness, you, you may get the one that just grabs you, you know, that seems particularly beneficial or just, just knocks you over. Um, and then you can go back to it later. Um, finally, I, th I think there is something to programs like uh, St. Saint, Saint John's and uh, directed studies where you just feel like, like you've achieved some, something massive in a community with other people who are trying um, to achieve the same thing. So I, I think there are a lot of benefits to, uh, to reading fast, but of course there, there's no substitute for then going back and, and reading slowly and rereading um, for the reasons that Diane mentioned. I, I don't think that you, that you really have to choose. I, I did, because you started with, um, with uh, the, the question of attention span of students, then you asked a very long question. I wanted that as yeah. a TikTok video. Um, but the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, the um, you know, I, I think uh, I certainly see students come in who um, don't have a ton of experience. They've maybe, you know, they, they certainly spent a lot of time with uh, teachers reading books, but they don't necessarily have the experience of, of ruminating on a text, posing questions to it, trying to get the text to answer back. And I, I think for those students, it, it is good to start slow um, and, and, and short, right? It might even be, uh, you know, speaking of Lincoln, you might start with a, with a brief work like, like the Gettysburg Address where, where students can see pretty quickly how rewarding it is um, to, to spend a lot of time um, going line by line. So I guess it's uh, slow, fast, slow. My next book will be called Reading Fast and Slow. <laughs> oh, it's a great idea. Uh, it's I, I've joked for years that my neck is going to be the purpose-driven Da Vinci Code and diet book. Take no chances with all the <laughs> all the enthusiasms, right? Um, uh, let's see. We got a good question from. Um, let's see. I have to scroll up to find it from Phil Melita, uh, who uh, talks about uh, the question of whether the liberal arts are practical for the real world. And so, you know, you hear a lot of people struggling with a dilemma on the one hand, and we can, we can start broadly and go narrowly on this or, or approach it from either end. But one of them is, are the liberal arts something that are for their own sake to make you a better human being? That's one of the old expansive understandings of it, make you a better citizen. Uh, or nowadays with our somewhat more mercenary education, we hear that employers want to know if a liberal arts major or a humanities major is going to make a good employee. I'll have to add that I do hear from a fair number of employers who say, I like hiring someone from the humanities, as long as I'm confident they actually know how to write a good business letter. But I like them because they're capable of thinking more abstractly and solving problems in their particular office. Um, so I don't think it's cut and dried that all employers think uh, that it's not practical. Um, uh, but let me start with you, Diane. Um, the particular form of the question would be, uh, do maybe you don't have enough data yet from alumni from the program, but I wonder if the engineers who go through it and science students who go through the program think it has added to their skills out in the workplace. And then you can also answer the more broader question about should we not get away too far from the traditional understanding of what the liberal arts are for? So we do have lots of contact with our alumni, and I think that's a, that's a very good indicator that what we did mattered to them. Um, and the number of students who get in touch with us and have asked, for example, for us to put a reading list on our website and links to the text that they might look at, um, I, I think that speaks to how valuable the liberal arts have been for them personally. And therefore, you know, that is a value in life, right? That is a that is an ongoing self-discovery that doesn't hopefully end after you've left college. In fact, it gets richer as you age. Um, in, in terms of, of practical value, I think Jonathan talks in his book about 
um, some of the problems that are that liberal arts uh, has has some of the problems with the liberal arts argument that has been publicly made that you know we teach critical awareness whatever that is um, as opposed to we teach reason I think the argument is is sound. Um, anybody would want to hire someone who knows how to reason through arguments and not accept the obvious polemical solution. <laughs> so, uh. um, you know, to, to some degree, we are by the back door or by teaching at a slant, we're, uh, we're teaching civics, we're teaching citizenship, we're teaching the basic uh, abilities that are required in a thriving democracy. Um, now that we can't put that on a resume <laughs> as directly as we might like, but I think that is the value that employers are seeing. Jonathan. Um, yes, I, I mean I want to begin by by expressing sympathy for the questioner because I, I think no matter how often you make the kind of argument um, that that Steve suggests um, one could make, it, it's very hard to get students to believe it. Right. Um, even if you got pretty good good data behind it, so so I sympathize with the question. Um, I, I will say that that one of my attractions to making the argument through Locke is he is addressing practical people um, along roughly the lines um, Diane suggests. Right? Why do you want to have comprehensive enlargement of mind, um, which does involve you know reading reading history and other. Um, subjects we look at in the liberal arts. You want comprehensive enlargement of mind because the understanding is our last recourse in, in every matter, in every important matter. So it's about it's about setting your mind um, in order um, and dealing with this problem of partiality. Um, and all this is a prerequisite to um, to operating in the world. Um, you know, I, I also use the example of. Um, uh, ben Franklin, right, and the Junta, where um, Fr Franklin has a club that, that that's a club that discusses natural philosophy, right, uh, but also discusses neighborhood watches and prospects mm -hmm. for practical success. And some of the rules for discussion, right, disputation is more or less forbid and follow along the kinds of rules um, that, that Locke suggests um, for um, uh, being able fruitfully to pursue the truth together. So, um, th these are you know, practical people addressing practical people. Yeah, so um, uh, one of our questioners, Carolyn Cooper, wants to ask specifically about what we're calling Gen Z now. I, I have I have to confess that I, uh, I, I lose the dividing lines between X, Y, and Z and boomers and millennials and all the rest. However, I do think it's true that you can see survey data showing that the current generation of students tend to be more sympathetic to what I would describe as illiberal points of view. You know, the First Amendment's not worth very much. Freedom of speech is uh, doubtful or should be cabined by some understanding of hate speech and so forth. Uh, so are, are either of you or both of you, do you see particular challenges with the current generation of students uh, that require more deliberate attention? I'll start with you on that, Jonathan, I think. Yeah, thanks. Um... So I, I do think that you can measure a change in, in attitude, certainly toward um, speech. I, I wouldn't necessarily describe it as a liberal, and I actually wouldn't pinpoint uh, Gen Z in particular. So the, the Higher Education Research Institute asks uh, on a pretty regular basis, um, for example, whether colleges um, have a right to ban extreme speech on campus. Um, that number, you know, hovered in the low 20s for a long time. They started asking in the 60s. Then they stopped asking for a while, I think, after, you know, 1986. And maybe they came back to it in 2004 when it was all of a sudden in the 40s, right? And, th and then it's climbed even a bit more since Generation Z came to college. And, you know, it, it's, I think it's now over 50, right? And you can see similar shifts. So they haven't been asking the question for as long on, racist, sex, uh, on, on banning racist and uh, sexist speech on campus. So, so I think there has been a change, but I, I'm, I'm suspicious of, um, of, 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 of generational arguments. 
Um, so, for example, people often say that, you know, the issue with Generation Z is that they were uh, raised in a kind of safetyist culture. You know, they never had to skin their knees um, and that kind of thing. And if you look at monitoring the future data, um, where they're asked questions about where, where people who take it, you know, these, these are eighth graders, 10th graders, 12th graders. When they're asked questions like, you know, do, do you like to take a risk? Um, it turns out that, you know, Generation Z, that there has been a dip, right, since, say, I forget what the date is, maybe since 2009. But in fact, you know, they're less risk averse, at least on the measure of these questions. And members of my hard scrabble generation that drove without seatbelts and went to school running there with scissors by ourselves. Um, so I'm <laughs> suspicious of, of, of arguments that, that suggest that, um, that there are sort of uh, uh, gener I, I mean, I think there are generational characteristics. I just think that I mean, clearly there are differences you know, between the silent generation and Generation Z. I just don't think we should be all that confident um, that we know very much about them. And so we, we really have to take a step back and try to just get to know our own students without worrying too much about statistical um, Generation Z um, kinds okay. of things. Well, I, I'm going to come back and press you on that a little bit, Jonathan, because I don't like your answer very much. But I want to let Diane in first to give her, see her, have her perspective on this question. So I, I agree mostly with that answer myself. Uh, and, and the reason is, I, I think Jonathan and I are both Generation X. And, and we are apparently far more risk averse, or we were in college than these students are. So I, I think those trends are, are considerably misleading. However, the, the place where I disagree to uh, somewhat is that uh, is, is the attention span factor and more significantly in terms of, of free speech, the fact that these uh, students have been subjected to trolls online. So, so um, modeled is trolling. It is not reasonable discourse. And, and I, I know that they bring that to college and I know that they therefore fear saying what they think because they, they immediately assume that they might be trolled. Um, if, however, again, back to your talking about orientation and, and how we frame what we do to students as they come in, if, however, we were to model that this is actually a place where you can relax and having someone listen and respond, not trolling, uh, I, I think that would that would in fact turn that curve. I think that we would see uh, much less concern about the need to suppress speech uh, if students realized that we're not talking about letting people troll them. We're talking about what we hope reasonable speech is. Well, my, my pushback to Jonathan, I mean, I partially agree that we shouldn't overstate these surveys. And I do find that when you, say, take a focus group approach and press students a little bit, they turn out to be more sympathetic to free speech. Uh, and I also think it's true that in a larger sense, increasing risk aversion has not been, the two haven't been linked. I think there is something serious about increasing risk aversion in society. I, I'm an old geezer, and I always like to joke with students that in my day, we had to get over the Goldwater defeat without grief counselors uh, and had to walk over the TV to change the channel, right? Okay. Uh, but I have heard students, Jonathan, and I want to press this question on you since you're a professor of politics, is I have heard students at Berkeley, good students, who say to me, look, the First Amendment, uh, I think, is obsolete. And the, the argument typically comes, well, one form of it everyone's heard. It's the compromised moral authority of these slave-owning guys like Madison who wrote the First Amendment, and why should that still be binding on us 240 years later? Uh, sort of a historicist argument. Um, and what I find is, is that when you talk to them, they're really unfamiliar with, you know, the theory behind the First Amendment of freedom of conscience and why religious freedom goes with the right of assembly and right of freedom of worship as well as freedom of speech. And they never heard these arguments. And that's why I raised the question, I wonder if we're not doing, I wonder if we've taken some aspects of the liberal tradition too much for granted today, and we're not deliberately teaching the history of free expression and freedom of conscience as deliberately as we ought to. And that's why I think um, you're too but, sanguine about Generation Z. <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm going to walk it back just a little bit because I, I agree with what um, Diane said. And um, 
you know, I don't want to take take too much time here, but um, you know, as as I acknowledged in discussing the Higher Education Research Institute survey, that there really has been a change, and it's quite possible some of it has to do with social media. I, I do think that we shouldn't exaggerate the um, just how bad things are out there. And in in 2019, the Heterodox Academy did a survey, and it did find. Um, that liberals were, you know, sort of somewhat reluctant um, to speak about controversial matters like race, gender, politics in general, and so on. Um, that conservatives were were more reluctant to speak about those things, um, and, and that they feared their peers much more than they they feared um, their professors. But the number of conservatives who said that they were reluctant to speak about race, right? That number was seven point seven. I should say very reluctant, which is I think what you have to most worry about. I'm somewhat reluctant to talk about anything, right? So 7.7% of conservatives were reluctant to speak about race. Now, from what you hear about these students, you would expect that number to be a kajillion percent. Um, yeah. So I, I think we, we absolutely have to worry about these things. And, and, and different surveys return somewhat different results. We do have to worry about them. If you see a change, right, with respect to um, free speech uh, attitudes, and your institution relies on those things, free expression, freedom of inquiry, um, that you have to rely, that then you have to you know, teach deliberately what you're up to and try to explain yourself. I think that's why a lot of institutions, um, 80 plus, I think, now have adopted the Chicago Statement of Principles on Free Expression. I think that's a welcome development. It's important to talk about those principles too, though, um, and orientation, as Diane was talking about, and unfold it. Um, courses of the sort Steve mentions are, are good too, but it's important to remember that um, I think that that our job is not to crank out free speech warriors, which I don't think um, that anybody is implying, right? We have to look at the arguments uh, in favor of free, free speech and take seriously the kinds of objections um, that Steve mentioned, though I, I don't encounter a lot of students who have that particular objection, um, but to take seriously those objections and um, and and see where students uh, get on that question. Free speech is an acquired taste. Um, I think one piece of it is having an experience of the kind of conversation um, in which people are are, are um, trying to improve their understandings together. That's a rare kind of conversation. Th those people may not come out free speech warriors, but they're going to understand something um, about the value of speech. And that's something I, I think we should be doing, you know, in all of our courses. So uh, this is a little bit like talk radio. We have a hard stop about two minutes from now. And I'm sorry I've held this last question for now because it's too big and sweeping. But the question is, are the liberal arts for everyone? Is liberal education for everyone? And what I mean by that is, is um, a lot of times these days we talk about diversity. We only put it in terms of, uh, you know, ethnicity and first time college students. And but I wonder if the broadening diversity, regardless of, of uh, race or ethnicity, also takes in a lot of students who it's just not their thing. They really are going to college for practical purposes of uh, primarily. And, uh, you know, what are the limits to saying that liberal education is the solution or however you want to think of it? And I'll start with you, Diane, for to start our last word on our exit question here. <laughs> oh, her microphone's off, I think. Can we get her, can we get Diane's microphone turned back on? Uh oh, Is it Diane, now? now you're up. You're up. Yeah, you're good. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so my very quick answer, sorry, it took too long to get it to you. Um, is right. it the liberal arts for anyone who is human? <laughs> They're about like humanity. That. They're about knowing how you are human. That's it. But what about, I mean, quickly, what about students who are bored by it? Do we have to make them eat their peas? Ah, uh, it depends on whether you frame it as eating their peas, right? I mean, the, the, the fundamental talk about lecturing students taught indirectly by in a conversation. I don't lecture the humanities nearly as well as you can discuss them. Yeah. Jonathan, we got about 45 seconds left. Okay, then I'll just briefly say that, that one thing I learned at the transition from being a graduate student at the University of Chicago to teaching um, first at Carthage um, and then at, um, at Ursinus 
um, is that, um, you know, I, I didn't think in some ways, I wasn't sure that, um, that teaching uh, the kinds of texts that, um, that, that I had learned so much from, that it would work. Um, but I think by and large, um, it does work. And if we can't teach people in some sense or another how to be reasonable or, or how to embrace reason via liberal education, we're, we're in a great deal of trouble. Well, Diane Sieber, I want to thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Jonathan Marks, and congratulations on your book. And sadly, we are out of time, but I always believe in the old show business axiom, always leave your audience wanting more. Thank you, viewers, uh, and we'll join you again sometime soon, I hope. <laughs> yeah. It, and uh, just thanks again, too, from the Bipartisan Policy Center for Jonathan and, and Diane for discussing Jonathan's new book, for uh, talking with us about uh, teaching and reading fast and slow. We really appreciate uh, the conversation today. And to the audience, thanks so much for joining us today. We know that all of you on college campuses have had a very hard 11 months and you have a difficult few months ahead, whether you're on campus or remote or hybrid, uh, we're wishing you the very best. Please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and you can learn more about the Bipartisan Policy Center and our Campus Free Expression Program at bipartisanpolicy.org where you can also subscribe to our monthly Campus Free Expression newsletter. Thank you and good day.